He's a man of mystery. An interpreter of dreams. He was thrown in the lion's den. All upon your name, o The three Hebrew boys. Oh, save me! Why do they not burn? The finger writing on the wall. A book written between the 6th and the 7th century BC. It's the apocalyptic book of the Old Testament. Join the Reverend Dr. Dylan Toussaint Wednesday nights at 7.30 for The Daniel Story. A book written by Daniel himself. The Daniel Story, Wednesday nights at 7.30. Welcome again to the online Bible study series of the Edgewater Waterford Circuit of Baptist Churches. A special welcome to those viewing from overseas. May our time together be instructive and inspiring. But before we proceed, let us pray. Gracious God, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So please, Guide us tonight as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week, we examined Daniel chapter 6, verse 3 to verse 9, under the sub-theme, Daniel's detractors. In so doing, after noting who they were and why they became his detractors, we highlighted the following about them. One, we highlighted their probe. Their, they probed Daniel in terms of the intent and extent so the intent of their probe was that they wanted to find some area of weakness in regards to his stewardship over the affairs of the empire. But the extent of their probe stretched across this vast empire, this media Persian empire that included the Babylonian empire. And their probe was extensive. Secondly, we noted last week their predicament. Predicament. Because they could not find any area of weakness in Daniel's work ethic. He was essentially faithful and faultless in his stewardship. Thirdly, we noted their proclamation. From their proclamation, it is obvious that they, be, they came to the realization that they would not find any grounds to convict Daniel in terms of his profession. So here is what they did. They determined to find it in terms of his religion. And then finally, we noted last week their plot. And their plot was based on dishonesty and deception. They told a lie when they mentioned that all, all of the leaders had met Daniel was not included in that number, but still they said all. And their deception, because they deceived Darius into signing this document under the guise that they were doing him a favor. In a nutshell, that was our study last week from Daniel chapter 6, verse 3 to 9. Tonight, we are looking at Daniel chapter 6, verse 10 
through to verse 11. Two verses, Daniel 6, verse 10 to verse 11. And I'm reading as usual from the King James Version. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, tonight, we are going to entitle or subtitle our study, Daniel's Daring Disobedience. I repeat, Daniel's Daring disobedience. And I begin tonight by reminding us of the decree which was signed by Darius in our study last week. Because that decree was based on the law of the Medes and the Persians. Now, this means it could not be revised or reconstructed. So, if anyone was found petitioning any god or man other than Darius for 30 days, he or she would be cast into the den of lions. That was the basic agreement and arrangement in terms of this decree that was signed by Darius. But instead of running or hiding from the authorities as many persons would have done, in this text we find Daniel praying. Praying. Many persons would have gone into hiding. Many persons would have found excuse to no longer be working in the empire. Many persons would Take with himself, as it were. But what we find is Daniel going into prayer. We find him praying. In essence, beloved, he responded to the threat on his, his life by first and foremost praying. And in so doing, he prayed as follows. I'd like to share with you five ways in which Daniel prayed. Number one, Daniel prayed openly. Openly. Found in verse 10, the first part of verse 10. I'll read it for you again. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house. And his windows being open in his chamber. Daniel here is praying openly. Notice he knew, he knew that the writing was signed. There's no doubt about that. He knew that this decree was made. Nobody could argue that he was ignorant of it. He knew about it. But he still went into his house opened his windows, and he prayed. This picture that you are seeing, I think is a beautiful depiction. This drawing really is a beautiful depiction of that which took place in the Daniel story. The window is opened, and obviously this is in the night or the evening. You see him looking up toward heaven. The windows are open, or the window is open. Persons on the ground, no doubt 
observing him and perhaps hearing him pray to his God. And this was an open public experience. The man is praying and everybody who is able to see knew that he was praying. He was not hiding the fact that he was praying. This was done openly. Now, by praying in such an open manner, Daniel was basically, in my view, sending a clear signal that, first of all, he was not afraid of his enemies. And by extension, he was not afraid of death. He was not afraid of his enemies, nor was he afraid of death. The fact, the fact is, beloved, he could have prayed secretly rather than publicly. He could have closed those windows, closed all the doors, ensured that not a soul would know that he was praying. But he opened the window and everybody who was below who could see him would know that he was praying. Perhaps in an act of defiance, I would say, to show and to say that he was not afraid of his enemies and he was not afraid of death. I believe that he was also sending a clear signal that he was not ashamed of his God. Yes, he was not ashamed of his God. Now, I want us to know this bit of information because when you put it into context, I think we better understand, we better understand what took place as he was praying openly. Because within that massive media Persian empire, the main followers and worshippers of Jehovah would be descendants of the Jews who had been exiled in Babylon. We know that from chapter 1. They would therefore have been in the minority rather than the majority. I want us to note that. That because they were exiled, taken, held captive, transported from their homeland in Judah, they would be in the minority. Even though they had children upon children, they would still be in the minority in this vast empire. But I also want us to know that be that as it may, Daniel obviously was not ashamed to openly and outwardly pray to the God of this minority religion in quotes. And we are talking about this within the context of the passage. So what I'm saying here and what I want us to note carefully is that Judaism would have been a minority religion at the time. The heathen gods of the Babylonians and the Persians and the Medes would have been, would have held sway. That would have been the dominant religion or religions, not Judaism. So this would have been a minority religion. But still Daniel opened his window while he prayed to his God because he was not ashamed of his God. Note the following words of Jesus in Luke 9. Yes, Luke 9 verse 26, where Jesus says, For whosoever shall be ashamed of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his glory. Let me say that again. Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. Some people are ashamed of their Christian heritage and belief. But Jesus is saying if you are ashamed of him and ashamed of his words, he will also be ashamed of us 
when he comes in his glory. Daniel was not ashamed of his God and he was not afraid of his enemies nor of death. What a testimony that this man was giving. So that was our first point, that Daniel prayed openly. Secondly, I would like to suggest tonight that Daniel prayed expectantly. In verse 10, the second part of verse 10, it states, and his windows being opened in his chamber, watch this now, toward Jerusalem. Toward Jerusalem. Well, that's interesting. He not only opened his windows, but he opened it facing Jerusalem. And a good question to ask is why? <laughs> why? Why would Daniel do this? Let's do a little background check in the scriptures. Because in 1 Kings 8, verse 48, it is evident that among Jews, the opening of a window toward Jerusalem while praying had great significance. It was not just done because it was something to be done or something that looked religious. This had great significance. And I'm going to now show you this verse and hope you'll see the significance that is highlighted in this passage. It reads as follows, And so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive, and pray unto thee toward their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for my name. Please note those words that are underlined. Pray unto thee toward their land, that's Judah, and the city, the city is Jerusalem, and the house, the house is the temple of God, which is found in Jerusalem. Great significance as they opened their windows while they prayed. So when Daniel did this, this was not just because it was fashionable, but it was done because there was significant meaning behind the practice. Let's see if we can drill down even further. And I'd like to suggest, therefore, that Daniel and the other Jews did this because Jerusalem was symbolic of two main things. One, it was symbolic of home. Their home. They were exiled from Judah. They were taken away from their homeland. Every time they opened that window toward Jerusalem, it would remind them of home sweet home. And they would look on that with expectant hearts that one day they'll return home. I believe it was also symbolic on the same note of hope. It was expectant hope that, that they were now saying, we are hopefully confident that one day, one day we will be no longer in this land as the psalmist says, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. And yea, we wept when we remembered Zion, Jerusalem. When we remembered Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? It was difficult for them, but there was still hope. Hope that one day, somewhere, somehow, at some time, they'll be back in their homeland of Judah. So when they looked on Jerusalem, the capital, that was the hope to return home. I'd like to suggest, beloved, that as Daniel prayed 
and continued continue praying in the midst of the threats on his life. Not only was it done openly, not only was it done expectantly, but I'd like to suggest it was done systematically. Systematically. In the third part of verse 10. He, here's what I find interesting. It says that he kneeled upon his knees. Watch this. Three times daily. Three times daily. Three times per day. Daniel was on his knees as he prayed to God. Openly and expectantly. Let's look at a psalm again. Psalm 55 um, verse 17. It says, evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. You saw that? Evening, morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. That's really and truly what this is saying is that in this practice, Jew, the Jewish practice, they ensured that prayer was done throughout the day, evening and morning and at noon. This ensured that prayer was done throughout the day. But also, this whole systematic practice ensured that prayer become or became a lifestyle throughout the year. Prayer would become a lifestyle throughout the year. So what we are finding there is that as they are praying, as they are praying unto God, as they are seeking God in prayer, three times per day, Prayer would be done throughout the day and prayer would become a lifestyle throughout the year. And I, I want to pause to ask us about this practice in relation to our lives. I want to ask us how often do we pray per day? I want to ask us how seriously do we see and take the importance of praying regularly. Daniel prayed systematically because the knew the importance of prayer being done throughout the day until it became a lifestyle throughout the year. What about us? The fourth observation I'd like to make about Daniel as he prayed was that he prayed inclusively. Inclusively. This is found in verse 10. The last part into verse 11. And I read it again for you. And gave thanks before his God. Verse 10. Then verse 11 picks up and says, Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication. Watch that. Before his God. So he gave thanks before his God and then he was making supplication before his God. Please note, beloved, that in essence, Daniel's prayer included Supplication, first of all. Daniel's prayer included supplication. And what is supplication? This is an earnest request asking for one's needs or the needs of others to be graciously supplied. That's what supplication is. You're asking, you're making a request for one's needs to supply those needs. But also, it could be for other people's needs to be supplied. Daniel is praying in terms of supplication. But also, included in his prayer is or was thanksgiving. 
Thanksgiving. And that is self-explanatory. Everybody knows what Thanksgiving is about. That, that when you are praying, when you are giving thanks, you are actually reaching out to God and say, God, I really appreciate what you have done for me. I've noticed the fact that oftentimes this may include as well uh, praise and adoration. Praise and adoration. So Daniel is praying and his prayer is done openly, expectantly, systematically, inclusively with supplication and thanksgiving. And what I find interesting is that many persons perhaps would have stopped at the supplication stage asking God for his intervention, asking God for his protection. But Daniel also found room and space in his prayers to thank God, to give God thanks, to praise him, to adore him in spite of what he was facing. What a beautiful example of prayer as it should be. Prayer as it should be. I'd like to suggest tonight that thir uh, you know, after looking on Daniel praying openly and expectantly, Daniel praying systematically, and Daniel praying inclusively, finally we see Daniel praying continually. Daniel praying continually. In the latter part of verse 10, it actually states that he did this as he did oftentimes. Oftentimes. Or as he did beforehand. Or as he was accustomed to do. Daniel was praying continually. Daniel was praying as he did before. The same type of prayer, the same prayer to the same God as he was accustomed to do. He did this a four time. In other words, beloved, I want us to note that this prayer that Daniel did was not an emergency prayer. Hmm? It was not an emergency prayer. It was not a prayer that it is when you're in trouble now we start to, be, to, to get holy and to be reaching out to God with passion. No. Daniel was accustomed to do this. It was his daily routine. This was now just another opportunity to approach God. And sometimes people wait until when the big problems come, the big issues come, the big challenges come, and that's the time they become prayer warriors. That's the time they draw close to God. That's the time they know God, and that's the time they are really praying and bawling out to God. No, for Daniel, this was not an emergency prayer. But neither was it a contingency prayer. It, it, it was not a contingency plan, just in case something bad happens. It wasn't to say, well, God, if I die, at least you, you remember that I was praying days before I died. No, 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 no. It wasn't a contingency prayer. It wasn't a just-in-case prayer. This prayer was done, as the King James says, a four time, as he was accustomed to do, as it was customary. Daniel continually prayed. And I pray that this be a challenge to all of us to ensure that we pray continually and don't wait until when the crises come. Okay. As per usual, I want to leave with us what I called some takeaways. Some takeaways 
in regards to this interesting story. Some takeaways I'd like to leave with us tonight. And the first takeaway is this. There is a time for civil disobedience as well as civil obedience. There's a time for civil obedience as well as a time for civil disobedience. There's a time when you obey the laws of the land and there's a time when you are obeying the laws of God which supersede the laws of the land. And if they are contrary, as Peter said in Acts 5, we ought to obey God rather than man. That is what happened in Daniel. Whether we like it or not, he was obeying the law of the land because the law of the land went contrary to the laws of God. As another takeaway, there's a time for private prayer. And of course, there's a time for public prayer. Some of you may have been wondering as we looked on the fact that he opened the window and was publicly praying. What about Matthew 6, where Jesus states, when you pray, go in your closet. The fact is, there's a time for that prayer, that type of prayer. But there's also a time when you pray in public. There's a time when you, you pray and nobody else knows. But there's a time when you pray and others would know and should know. So we, we ought to balance the two ends of the spectrum. That there's a time for private prayer. There's a time for public prayer. And we ought to know the difference. There comes a time when you take a stand. And you don't have to pray secretly. But you don't, you don't mind who is listening. Because you're praying to God. And you're sending a signal to those who are hearing. That is the reality. That comes out of this passage. I'd like to leave with us. As usual as well. Some questions to consider. And I leave three questions for us. Question number one. What are the factors which should determine acts of civil disobedience? In other words, when you reach that point, that stage in life, what should be the factors determining civil disobedience? Two. If I were in Daniel's position, what would I have done? What would you have done? What would we have done? Thirdly, even when I'm facing dangerous and depressing, depressing situations, how much do I offer thanksgiving unto God? Remember, Daniel was facing danger. It was a depressing time. For him and the Jews. But still he found room. For giving God thanks. Uh, and how about us tonight? In our regular prayer routine and regimen. Do we find time and make time. To give God thanks for his goodness and his graciousness. Toward us. Before I pray tonight, I'd like to remind us that there's now a portal where you can send your questions and or comments. And I'm going to invite you, as I did last time, to send those questions or comments to the following email address. The Daniel Story 2020 at gmail.com. I repeat, the Daniel story 2020 at gmail.com. And so, let us pray. God, as we bow in your presence tonight, oh, how we are challenged by the example of your servant, Daniel. 
Lord, we are seeing that he not only prayed, but he prayed openly, expectantly, systematically, inclusively, and continually. Lord, these challenging scenes that we, we, we see in the life of Daniel in this text are speaking to us in a real and powerful way. Challenging us, O oh God, in regards to our prayer lives. Challenging us in terms of how we face those situations that come at us, that make us distressed, disturbed, perhaps discouraged, and even despondent. Help us to see the importance of having a regular, systematic prayer life. So that our prayer life and our prayers, Lord, would be power-packed. They would empower us, Lord, to face the challenges that are ahead. Lord, spare us from the emergency and contingency prayers. Help us to be consistent. And we thank you for hearing our prayers for challenging us tonight spare us from being hearers and not, not doers we pray and we ask in jesus name amen thank you for joining us we hope you will join us again as we worship together please remember to pray for each other there is power in prayer have a blessed week in the lord